This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to call the City of Warrenville Public Safety and Finance Committee the whole regular meeting, March 25th, 2024, to order. Can I have a roll call, please? Mayor Brummel? Here. Alderman Lockett? Aye. Here. Alderman Ashour? Here. Alderman Barry? Here. Alderman Davalos? Here. Alderman Augustinovich? Here. Alderman Wilkie is excused. Alderman Widener? Here. Alderman Kruckenberg is excused. You have a quorum. Thank you. Would everybody that can please raise for the pledge? Okay, tonight, do we, I, I don't have anything up here, but do we have any public comments? No public comments tonight? <clears throat> we'll move on to official and staff comments. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a um, personal message from the Tripp family. I saw a rush trip today. Uh, for those of you who know Russ and Sue, they've been around town for a long time. Sue um, has been struggling for several weeks now uh, with cancer. It uh, unfortunately is a very aggressive cancer. Um, she is currently at home on hospice, and uh, Russ wanted uh, the friends of the family to know that that's the case and invite people to stop by um, just for a few moments uh, to check in and say hello to Sue and uh, let her know uh, how much you care about her. So um, if you do have the opportunity in the next few days, I know it would be appreciated by the family. Uh, they're doing their best to get through a very difficult situation that was uh, completely unexpected several weeks ago. So um, please do keep them in mind. Thank you. I'm so sorry to hear that. Is there anyone else? We'll um, move ahead with business in the meeting. <clears throat> Number one, informational presentation on accomplishments and improvements of the city communication. Well, good evening. It's great to be here to give you an overview of what's been happening the past couple of years. They've gone by so quickly, I feel like I, I just blinked and suddenly we're getting into this the second year of my being here and it's it's been fantastic. So as I came on board as communications coordinator, there were some goals set, and some of those included providing information to the public, growing and improving the city's communications, evaluating the effectiveness of the city's outreach, and improving the city's engagement with the community. And so this is really a look at how it started and how it's going. So to get started, how have I been spending my time? Among other things, I looked at some of the marketing tools that the city already had and, looked to, and thought about whether there was room to include anything else. I like to have what I call a marketing funnel. It's really just a fancy way of saying, I don't like to put all my eggs in one basket. So I never want to rely on one way of communicating with the public. And in this case, I was lucky because I came here and there was already a print newsletter, we had a Facebook presence, and we had a robust website. So it was an opportunity to look at those to see what could be done. I thought redesigning hometown happenings might be a good way to get going to create some predictability, add some more photos and color, and then look at ways to make it more interactive. So we started using QR codes in the print edition. Those have been really popular. And we've also created an interactive online edition so that when we send out the sneak peek to the community, they have an opportunity to have a clickable edition. So if they want to follow through to a news story or a sign up form, they can do so from the ease of their phone or computer. 
We expanded the city's Facebook presence. It was nice to see a really strong following, and I just saw an opportunity to really build on that, to try to create a voice, a friendly, welcoming, casual kind of a voice that would make people feel like we're part of the community, we want to hear from them. And anecdotally, just the fact that we sometimes get messages through our Facebook page from people in the community shows me that they do see that, they do feel that, that they can approach us really easily with any question or concern that they have. And of course, Facebook is a really visual medium, so I thought let's try to amp it up too in terms of our graphics presence and really try to stand out because when you look at Facebook, there's so much going on and it's really important to try to stand out from all that other noise. We also had an opportunity to redesign the website. And this was a case where we got to do something I love to do, and that's use data to guide your decisions. We already had an idea of what people were interested in on the website. It's just they sometimes had trouble getting there. They were doing a lot of searches to find some of the basic activities they wanted to undertake on our website, like look for a job or fill out a building permit application. So in our redesign, we tried to arrange it so that as soon as they got to our website, those links would be available to them. And it was really gratifying to see that the searches for those items went down drastically because now the information was there and people could go and do whatever it is they really wanted to do. I get to work with departments on their key projects, and one of the things we've done recently is create a postcard for the Parkway Tree Program. It's going to Summer Lakes residents because we would really like them to sign up for a tree, and that should be going out shortly. And then I thought, I, I'm a big fan of email marketing. I know that sometimes in the world of marketing, people like to dismiss email newsletters, but Sometimes even the people who say they don't really read them actually do. It's just in how you present it. We do have an eager crowd that looks forward to Friday morning when FYI Warrenville goes out. But then I also share it to Facebook. And there are a number of people who just enjoy getting it that way. It's not in the clutter of their email inbox, but they know it's Friday morning. It's going to be coming. And so I've been gratified by the response we've gotten to that. And people seem to enjoy getting a sort of weekly roundup of what's going on. And it's also a way for us to work more closely with our community partners and support them. So I mentioned data earlier, and like I said, I just really love using the data if you have it because it can help you make really good decisions. And I want to be careful how I spend my time and make sure that what I'm doing benefits the city and its residents the most. We did a community survey in 2023, and what we learned is the top two ways residents get their information are from hometown happenings and our website. What I especially love about that is we pretty much control those in terms of the content. Now, granted, we send the newsletter to a printer, but still, we have a good relationship with them. We've worked out a really good schedule. And of course, the website is our property. And so the fact that people already enjoy using it just gives us the incentive to continue to do more to get people to remember the website and go to it first when they need or want information. And also our statistics, and we pull statistics monthly wherever we can, show that on, web, on our website and on Facebook, we have high levels of site visits and engagements. So that's also really gratifying. And I think it speaks a lot to Warrenville, where people really want to be involved and they really want to know what's happening. And when we did that website redesign, it was an opportunity to enhance our news section, for instance. And I thought, well, if we enhance it, I'll make sure to update it regularly. And so it's really fantastic that people really go to that site. And I believe more and more people are learning that, oh, I can go there and see what's happening. And this is just a breakdown of the survey result that showed the top three ways that people get their information about the city. What I found really interesting about this is the top two, as I mentioned, were the newsletter and website. And if you look at the very unlikely category, it's really small. And to me, that was another sign that if we continue to get the word out to people that we have this monthly newsletter and we have a really robust website, we're going to get more and more people paying attention. I mean, sometimes it's easy in your mail to get things jumbled up. But again, we have an opportunity to let people know it comes out on the first day of each month. Look for it. And with the website, it's there 24-7. That's the real beauty of it. By the way, Chief Bonilla is in the picture in the top corner here. We have our two chiefs at the Polar Plunge, which is a really wonderful day. What I wanted to show you with the Facebook audience is that 
a lot of times people say Facebook skews older, and that can be true, but if you look at our numbers, we actually have a younger audience on Facebook, which is really fantastic. It's also interesting to me anyway because Facebook does so much to try to control each person's experience, and they tend to not want to emphasize content coming from pages. And again, I think that ties back to the fact that people in Warrenville want to know what's going on, and because they support the content that we post, it simply builds our presence, and it sort of beats that whole idea that on Facebook you can't be successful if you have a business page. But how are we doing? Again, let's take a look at the numbers. If you look at our website, our total visitors, our total page views, way, way, way up. And again, I think that the more that we continue to keep the website regularly updated, for example, we also have a robust calendar section that was expanded during the redesign. It gives people more incentive to come to the site, and then they discover other things. And then I thought it would just be fun to mention the top 10 pages visited. This list shifts slightly, but not much. It's been very consistent in the time I've been here in terms of building permits, the homepage, jobs, news, calendar, agenda center, online payments, licenses, and permits. And so that's also just a signal to us to make sure that we keep those pages up to date. On Facebook, again, we've been incredibly fortunate. Our community wants to know what's going on. We're trying to make sure that they know what's going on. And it really shows in the numbers. I have so many friends in marketing, not just uh, government communicators, but other people in marketing who have been really struggling to get the kind of numbers that we're getting. I think having that regular schedule of posting, trying to have strong graphics, and really trying to stay tapped into what the community is interested in. And I think, too, the more I'm here and the more all of us work together more effectively, it just makes us an even stronger presence. And so it's been really gratifying because these numbers are a little harder to come by sometimes. And it's good to know that we can count on Facebook as a tool. We can't always get the data that we would like to get. So for example, with hometown happenings, we know it's mailed to every home, but we don't get a breakdown beyond that. That's why using the QR codes, for example, was a really great way to try to get a sense of, are people paying attention to anything? And the QR codes show that, yes, people really enjoy that. Also, I'll do things like track web activity because, of course, a lot of times I'm trying to drive people to the news section of our website. I really want to emphasize that news section because it is regularly updated, and I want to create that expectation in people that they can go there anytime. So I do notice a big spike in our news section when Hometown Happenings comes out. And what's interesting is people do tend to hold on to their newsletter. So sometimes I'll go back a week or two later and look at some of the statistics, and I'll see that, for example, with the QR codes, the numbers are still going up because there are people who maybe put the issue aside and then they did come back to it and they uh, took whatever activity they planned on doing, whether it was visiting a web page or finding a form so they could sign up for something. And then there's the outreach component. And that's, that's a really wonderful way to be able to get out into the community and get to know people and hear from them firsthand what they're interested in, what their questions are, and of course, to let them know about us and all that we do and the ways that we try to keep them informed. I regularly meet with my counterparts at the school, library, and park district. It's not just a great social time, but we can talk marketing, we can talk about what's going on and how we can help each other. I also stay in touch with a lot of our community organizations. It's great when we have that electronic sign because that's a really wonderful way to be in touch with a lot of people regularly and get to know who's who. And then I will try to stop by meetings, Lions, Warrenville and Bloom, and so on whenever I get a chance. And then I'm always looking for opportunities to meet with new residents, and especially those who are more underrepresented. And the picture on this slide is actually from the Johnson Family Dinner, which is held during the school year at Johnson Elementary School. And the wonderful thing here is that we have a number of people, English is not their native language, they're newer to the community, so they're still learning, and it's a great place for us to be. And especially this year with the special census, I've been able to take those materials in Spanish from the Census Bureau and share them with people so they understand what's going on. 
or if they're interested in a job, I let them know they're looking for field workers. But now I'm starting to focus on the actual census itself so they understand when the letter arrives in the mail, it is something legitimate, it's quick and easy, and it really helps the city. So this has been a wonderful way to meet a whole range of new people throughout the community. In terms of what's next, we are really excited about the future. I think you've been seeing now in the weekly reports for a while, we've got a new website in the works, and we'll be able to build on everything that we've learned to date. And what I'm particularly excited about is Granicus, the new website provider, they really get it. They also understand that it's not just about having the right elements on your website, but making sure that users don't have to do a lot of scrolling down pages and a lot of clicking around. Because that just, it, it aggravates people, it makes them lose their place in their thought, and they, they don't want to stick around on the page any longer. So I'm really excited about what we'll be able to do with them. And of course, the new mobile app. This is going to be fantastic. It's going to be so convenient for people to do all kinds of things, whether it's getting news or filling out permits, reporting problems, paying bills. Obviously, staff is putting in a tremendous amount of work to get this accomplished, but it will definitely be well worth it. I didn't want to keep you here for a long period of time, but I hope I've given you at least a good overview of what we've been trying to accomplish. It's been a wonderfully exciting couple of years, and I can't wait for what comes next because we've got so many great things happening. And if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions from the council? I'll unlock it. Yeah, a couple things. Thank goodness for you and the bombardment of uh, and reminders. Uh, my mom kept reminding me for the flashlight Easter egg hunt on Friday, and I didn't do it. Then she kept sending me the link. Then she kept sending me the link. It was like every time you posted, she reacted by texting. <laughs> Finally, I got it done. So I had read about it. I saw it all. I just didn't have time. So it, some people need that, you know, so I appreciate that. Um, the hometown happenings is a big thing in my house. There will be grounding if anyone throws it away, even though we get the advanced copy, right? I like to read the paper side of it as well. Um, but just to see these numbers is just amazing. The data is so important, and the fact that we can actually put these numbers to paper and to say, hey, you know, we did this, it's getting results, it's making a difference in the community is just it's awesome. So it's, it's great that you put all this together and so glad to see it. So thank you for everything you do on this. Anyone else? Anybody? Alden Widener. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, greatly improving the city's communication efforts uh, since you've been here for two years. It seems like uh, you've only been here a short time, but a lot of progress has been made. I've seen the communications become more frequent more timely, and definitely more informative for our residents. So thank you for that. Um, I, am, I was just going to ask, you mentioned some of the other groups that you interact with. Um, is DuPage Convention and Visitors Bureau on that list of people that you interact with for marketing purposes? Yes. 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 There's a whole okay. network throughout DuPage as well, yes. Okay. And then um, the other thing I... I know from time to time there'll be tornado warnings or you know certain crisis situations that the city could involve itself with, and I just wonder whether there's an initiative and an outreach uh, effort and program that you've established uh, that helps in, in those situations. You know, I'm really looking forward to the changes that we're going through both with the app and the website because I feel that's really going to enhance it. Uh, there are some good things about our current provider, but I think they're weak in certain areas, and I, I would count that as one of them because I would also like to see something more robust, and it's something that I also have on my list to talk to Chief to in more detail as well and solicit some of his ideas. Okay. And then uh, lastly, I'm just curious. I know there's a number of artificial intelligence programs out there for marketing professionals and communications individuals. Have you dabbled with the use of those at all or uh, tried any of them out? Well, it's kind of a trick question because, for example, we have a subscription to Canva, and that's where I get a lot of my design from. And Canva already has a lot of AI 
in there. But what's beautiful about it is that we have the subscription, so everything on Canva is ours to use. We don't have to worry about plagiarism. We don't have to worry about any kind of ethical issue. And yet, their automation just makes the work we do so much easier. For example, when I talk about that marketing funnel, I could be creating graphics for at least two sites on our website. It could be the news section as well as the slider, the banner at the very top of the page. There's Hometown Happenings, there's Facebook, there's FYI Warrenville. So right there, I'm already up to nearly half a dozen. And the beauty of AI on Canva is that once I have a design I like, within seconds, I can create all those different sizes and I'm done. And then I'm just ready to start getting the word out. So that's fantastic. But I think the AI you're talking about is when people use those AI tools to create. I think from an ethical standpoint, it needs to be avoided. Uh, I think the best description I read of AI is that um, you know, it's an innovation, but it needs to be managed. It's a strategy. It's not a solution. And the biggest problem is that, let's say, for argument's sake, I decided to go into one of the AI programs and have it create a graphic for me. What I don't know is if I have permission to use that image. You know, is this a copyright infringement? And that's the last thing I would want to do to the city. So unfortunately, I just don't see this being addressed in a satisfactory manner at this time. So I would avoid it unless I know, for example, I'm in Canva and everything I use there is safe for us to use. And it's also unfortunate, too, because the social media sites have been very careless about ensuring that what they're getting is legitimate to use. Although I did see an article today that made me feel good about YouTube. In fact, now when they feel that people may be enhancing their content, before you can post, you have to answer a series of questions. So they're doing a lot more now to ensure that what people are seeing is real, and, and they also want people to label it if it has been artificially created. So there are still so many ethical issues. And so on the one hand, the automation is wonderful, but I don't think you can just let yourself loose. And of course, I always am conscious of the fact that I'm representing the city government and any mistakes that I make is be a reflection on the city. Thank you. And um, I know AI also offers a lot of writing programs too that sometimes you can just get ideas if you're developing a press release and submit your own written version and then and within seconds like you say you get something back and I just wonder how that works with authorship and whether or not you can utilize that help and then kind of go through it on your own and make your final edits before you release release something. Right. Well, I do think, I mean, there was one day, I don't remember now what it was I was writing, <clears throat> excuse me, and it stuck me, it struck me as a little dry, and I thought, boy, <laughs> my brain is just not firing all the way up. So I went into chat GPT, and this was material I created, I could verify all the facts, so I felt perfectly comfortable saying to chat GPT, I just need this to be a little more fun, light, and conversational, and it just quickly turned it around. So in, in that respect, yes, it can be very handy. I would just not ask it to create something from scratch because again AI learns by pulling from all over the web but they're literally stealing content and then repurposing it and there's no credit given so I, I never trust it in that respect but if it's something that I've created or it's something created in-house and I feel like maybe it could use a little help then yes absolutely it, because it can save you some time especially on those days when you feel like you've got a lot going on and you you just really want it to be a little bit better Great. Well, thank you and um, appreciate the fact that you're giving it all a discerning look and making sure that the city's in a safe place um, liability-wise for anything that it use, utilizes in any of those AI platforms. And uh, thank you for all your communication efforts. Appreciate it. Alderman Davalos. Thank you. Um, so things have changed for the better. I want to thank you also for all that you do. And um, it was several years ago, I don't know, seven or eight or something, when I think the council realized and the staff realized that the staff was not going to be able to begin to have the time to do what was coming down the pike as far as communication, social media, all of the stuff you've talked about tonight. And But at that point, we couldn't really afford uh, to have a communications director and worked really hard to make that happen and I think it was one of the very best decisions we did because your the effect of your work and your expertise has touched so many areas more than just the the city and the city council and the staff it's just 
gone out into um, all these communication things, and I know that I value you as a resource on some of the commissions and that sort of thing. So thank you for all this work that's going on. I think it's been wonderful. A um, Couple questions. I used to get the weekly um, newsletter, but I think I switched a program. Anyway, now I don't. So for people that would like to know how to sign up for that weekly newsletter, how would they do that? Would they go to the city website and sign up that way or contact the city in another way? Yes, well, I've, I've had people contact me directly and I've signed them up. <laughs> I guess I'd be happy to look yours up. But yes, and typically on uh, when we share it to Facebook, we also have the link on there so people can sign up directly. Because sometimes the notification piece is a little harder to find on the website, so I just find resharing it that way tends to get some people to sign up because they'll see it and think, oh, I should get this myself. Okay, and the mobile app is not something we have now, obviously, but it will be pulling some of those functions off of the website into a more convenient way to do things. Is that basically what, what yes. you're trying to say? Yes, okay. it really simplifies it. I, I think part of the problem, too, is these days a lot of websites, you can get them on your phone, but it involves a lot of scrolling. Things don't mm -hmm. really line up properly. And with the app, you literally just open the app and it's there. They tend to be more icon based, but it just it's a great user experience because it's right there in front of you. You don't have to scroll around. You can just look at the categories and then just click on the one that interests you. So they're just designed to work really quickly and efficiently. And the last thing is the new website. Do you have a timetable for when that? I know it's going to take time, and mm -hmm. but it will be there, but do you have any sense of? Yeah. We're, we're, we're hoping August. Oh, okay. That's Some great. of that, I mean, I know Granicus has a lot on their plate, but that's what they're working toward, and we're making sure that anytime we have deliverables, that they're getting them, if not early, then on time, so that we can stay on track. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mayor Brummel. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as Alderman Davalos alluded to, we, we, for a long time, knew that we needed to do a better job in communicating. And uh, it was frustrating that we didn't have the resources to do that, so we created the position of communications coordinator. And then we really hit the jackpot when we were able to hire you for that position because your professional expertise and enthusiasm for the job is just remarkable. You're doing a great job. Um, of course, one of the best things about getting information out is that you fill all those voids out there that we know when there are a lot of voids that get filled with whatever comes to mind for people. Hey, what's going on over there? Well, then you come up with 12 different things. You can go to our information sources and find out what's going on. So I think that's a huge plus for us now. And I, I've, changed, I've seen a lot of changes uh, on what happens on Facebook because people are able to get factual information. They don't have to go on there and make something up that fits um, what they think is happening. So I, that's a great service that you're able to do for us. So you've taken us from the dark ages and right to the cutting edge of how to do this thing properly. And that's very much appreciated by us and certainly by our citizens. So I'm glad you're with us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say you hit the ground running and have done a great job and everybody appreciates it. Thank you. Do you want to just stay there for uh, oh. item number two? Sure. <laughs> Consideration of a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Warrenville Public Library, Library District <clears throat> for the sharing of social media archival services. The City and Warrenville Public Library District each individually maintain a subscription service with Archive Social for the purpose of archiving social media communications and maintaining public record accessibility. To reduce costs, the City is proposing to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the WPLD to share archival services costs. Those shared costs would be prorated based on a percentage that considers the total number of individual archive social media accounts. The city would act as the system administrator for the shared subscription plan and would be reimbursed by the WPLD for their share. And then there's a, a copy of the proposed IGA. Any questions? Mayor Brummel. Uh, just a comment that um, another example of how our um, 
taxing bodies get along in Warrenville, which is not the case in a lot of communities. We make every effort to support each other with the realization that we serve the same people. So I'm glad to see this type of thing happening. Um, it happens all along, and I support it completely. It's, it's, the way, it's the Warrenville way of doing things. We cooperate. Yeah, in, in addition to what the mayor said, it also creates probably a cost-saving uh, efficiency. So uh, that's appreciated by combining this. And with that, I would make a motion um, to recommend the city council approve an intergovernmental inter agreement with the Warrenville Public Library District authorizing the sharing of social media archival services effective May 1st, 2024 through May 1st, 2029, renewing annually thereafter. Second. We have a motion and a second discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? Motion carries, thank you. Next item is non-represented non market adjustments. Um, assistant Administrator. Thank you. Good evening. Included with your agenda backup material is the proposed annual market-based increase for non-union employees. This is also commonly referred to as the cost of living or the COLA increase. And the benchmarks that we use to determine the increase are directed by City Council in past practice. Those benchmarks are listed in your memo. And also Exhibit A provides historical information on both the union and non-union COLA and STEP increases, and that is included for comparative purposes only. As a reminder, the union increases are set by the language within each respective collecting bargaining agreement. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the council? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Unlock it. I'd like to make a motion. City Council approve the 3.4% fiscal year 2025 market-based increase for non-union employees as included in the proposed fiscal year 2025 budget. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes carry the motion. <clears throat> Number four, establishing a work group concerning non-highway vehicles. Uh, Chief Bonilla. Thank you, good evening. At the August 7th, 2023 City Council meeting, the council directed staff to begin investigating the possibility of forming a work group concerning the golf cart issues and to bring the item forward in the spring for consideration as we review the fiscal year 2025 budget. Included with your agenda packet is a memorandum from City Attorney Lenneman uh, with the information for possibly approving uh, non-highway vehicles in the city of Warrenville and has all the steps in there to include um, how we go about doing that. The staff is concerned over the requirements that the city must have findings and a determination that public safety will not be jeopardized is one of the items that's listed in City Attorney Lenneman's memo. Um, so additional, we feel that additional research and analysis by traffic engineers recommended to determine the appropriate standards and limitations if the direction is to move forward with this item. So we have two options that we could follow, and that's one is the city takes no further action, and the police department would continue to enforce the Illinois Vehicle Code as it is, um, which would pertain to non-highway vehicles. And this obviously would not require a motion tonight. Um, option two would be to form the work group um, and evaluate permitting certain non-highway vehicles on the city streets. So the, the action that we're looking for tonight is if we do that, the council should consider that um, 
some of the things that we'd have to go through in order to form th this work committee. Well, we could form the work committee, but some of the things that we'd have to consider during that work committee. Um, we have to make that decision that the city streets are safe enough for non-highway vehicles. Now, the problem that we face is that we checked the Chicagoland area, and the only locations that non-highway vehicles are allowed are in gated subdivisions or um, areas where they surround golf courses, not necessarily in a community that fits Warrenville's demographics, roadway demographics. So there's certain things that we'd have to consider, and one of the things was probably hire an engineer. Now, we made recommendation that we did, the staff didn't feel that the non-highway vehicles were safe. Um, so we think that if we do move forward with this, we probably should consider getting an engineer to do a traffic study with an estimated cost of about $20,000. So those are some of the things that we ask that the committee consider when forming this work group tonight. Just a couple comments before I uh, take questions from the council. The, the uh, way that this was brought up at the pre-meeting is not, didn't come back the way I expected. I mean, in the past we had talked about LSVs, not golf carts. Um, had requested that the city consider something that mimicked the state's LSV regulations, which don't require an engineer. The uh, use of the vehicles, the speed of the vehicles, the type of roads that they would be used on is all spelled out in the code. The only difference was it, the suggestion was that we possibly license them and capture some of that revenue. It wasn't to consider the uh, possibility of all non-highway vehicles. That, well, that's something that no one on this council has ever brought up. Well, when I presented my um, presentation uh, at the August 7th meeting, um, I spelled out the difference between the low-speed vehicles and the non-highway vehicles. Currently, we do allow low-speed vehicles because that's the state statute. It's the non-highway vehicles that are not allowed currently. So if we were to change the ordinance to allow non-highway vehicles, which would be the typical golf carts that we're referring to, um, then we would have to change the ordinance. And before we do that, we'd the work group would have to probably take into consideration the safety of the community. The, um, I just don't see the need for the amount of money you're suggesting because we're not talking about most of what you have brought up here, but I'm happy to hear any comments from the council. I'll unlock it. So it looks like it's been expanded, right? I mean, because now we're talking Right, non-highway and LSVs, but golf carts could be in both. Sure. Right. It's just that with the LSVs, the issue that the existing residents who have golf carts is that they're not able to register them due to a VIN. That's part of the problem, yes. Okay. And yeah, it's just so hard, right? Because it's like they exist now and they have existed here. And originally in August, I did vote against this. Um, I think it's good that it is getting expanded because if you do this work group and then you only say golf carts, yes or no, that still leaves you open to other vehicles. You could have quads, you could have dirt bikes, you know, you could have everything all over the place. Um, but do you think if, and this is, I, I guess, hard to answer, but I mean, if we, were to consider everything and don't look and just say no to the non-highway and adopt the state stature of LSV, would we still need to spend the 20000 on the engineering no, uh, we, study? We no. wouldn't have to do anything. That, that would be part of option one because okay. they're already legal per state. Yeah. So we, I think the issue was, though, is that most of the residents, they have no issue with the LSV other than the fact that they can't register that vehicle because of the lack of a VIN. Correct. Then it would fall under that non-highway vehicle. Non-highway. And then that's what we would need the work group to identify what 
type of non-highway vehicles, which come in all shapes and sizes right. um, and has different requirements for different ages. So right. we'd have to specifically f- spell out what non-highway vehicles we're talking about, right. how fast can they go, where they can go. Um, and we felt that, you know, throughout the city, they're, they're just not safe because there's so many different sizes and so many different speeds and so many, like, we're not just talking about golf carts. I mean, we're talking about all different types of non-highway vehicles. So do we open the floodgates to just let whatever hit the streets just because they can't register them? I, I, I don't know. I, I, we'd have to have that work group and then figure that out. But I, I know that we talked last year and it, we, we felt that that just wasn't safe, not, in, not the way our community has grown and, and the way some of our streets are. Right. No, and I agree with you. I think if you're going to do it, knock it all out, have that conversation, do the work group, figure it out, um, and, and just see what, you know, what is best for the community. Because I, I've told others this too. I, I've actually had people approach me, ask me what's up with the golf carts. I always ask them, do you have one? No. Do you intend on getting one? No. We just want to know what is allowed and what is not allowed. Because we're kind of in this gray area because they've been allowed previously, right, for the most part. Everyone, you know, 4th of July, Cerny Park, you see it all summer. Sure. You know what I mean? And I feel for you guys, because you're kind of in this area to where it's like, what do you do then? Do you just start going out, ticketing everybody? You, you know what I mean? So it's, I think it's getting to the point to where I think this has to be done in order to have definitive black and white, what are we doing, what's happening, what are we allowing, what are we not, so that all questions get answered. I've actually had residents ask me the same thing, um, and they've responded the same way. They said, we don't plan on getting a golf cart, but the reason they were asking is because they want to be aware of what is sharing the road with them. Mm -hmm. That's why they were asking. Exactly. Yeah. And I think by adding these with the dirt bikes, the quads, the, I mean, we could, the work group could talk about scooters, you know what I mean? We could talk about anything that's somewhat motorized, but I definitely think that the group, for me, I think at this point, at least putting it together to start that in motion would probably be the best thing. Thanks. On the devils. Thank you. So in your experience, either here or in talking with other municipalities, <clears throat> the slow-moving vehicle, or the slow-speed vehicle, whatever the heck it is, um, <laughs> what are people doing with electric bikes now? And I know there are two-wheeled electric bikes. Mm -hmm. There are wider three-wheeled electric bikes. Um, is that, does that get rolled into the slow moving vehicle and it's just allowed as long as, the, are they following the minimum requirements that were listed in the attorney's memo? Um, like one of the things I didn't like between the two is you have to, I mean, I, I'm glad they have seat belts in there for um, non-highway vehicles, but seat belts don't seem to be necessary in the slow moving. So that's, so there's different, restrictions. My problem to begin with, besides some other issues, is I don't even know what the new electric vehicles coming down the pike, and I mentioned two, but there's others. I mean, can you drive an electric lawnmower? I mean, a riding mower down the road? Is that the slow? I don't know what is included in that category that has, um, that is already legal as long as the requirements are met. Can you help me at all just understand what we're talking about? Because it's not just golf courts, I don't think, carts, I don't think. Well, I, I mean, that's what we were just referring to is that the non-highway vehicles come in all shapes and sizes, and they come in all kinds of, they could be two-wheeled, four-wheeled, three-wheeled. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on. You know, whatever has a motor in it and, you know, goes forward is would be a non-highway vehicle. Now, I don't think the electric bikes fall under that category. I still feel like they fall under the bicycle. Um, but then there's some, I, I've seen some kids that have put little motors on their bikes and now they're more like a dirt bike than, or a motorcycle, depending on the CCs on there. So there's different laws for different types of vehicles. And it, it, would, it, it would really be re really lengthy and I wouldn't be able to recite it off of memory off of all the statutes that, for the different categories of vehicles that there are. Um, but I mean, that would be something that 
that we would have to probably identify here. As far as other communities, uh, there are no communities around us that allow non-highway vehicles. Um, the, uh, the nearest one I found was Elgin, and that was in a gated community surrounding a golf course. And they're not allowed to ride them outside of that gated community. That's in, just in our area. Now, I know we've been presented with others from other communities, but we're talking about similar demographics to us. We just don't have the experience in this to, to make a judgment for or against at this point. Can we just categorize all these vehicles as slow moving and forget the non-highway? Because the non-highway is illegal right now, sort of, and there's the, the state, I mean, unless you pass an ordinance, as I understand it, the, right. the state is saying, if you have these minimum things, you're good. So what if we just didn't even think about non-highway? We just put everything into slow moving. I know the VIN number's a problem for residents, but let's put that aside for a minute. Is that an easier way to go and just not even talk about it? Well, I don't think that was one of the options that uh, City Attorney Lenneman researched. I think it's either we adopt the ordinance as it is or we don't. Well, the ordinance as it is from the state, right, says that slow-moving vehicles, they're already adopted. They're already okay yes. from the state point of view. Correct. And we didn't get any information if municipalities um, around us are, are forbidding them. I don't know if they can. If the state says you can have them, I don't know. That would be a question I would have. Can you just categorize you all these things as slow moving and forget the problems with the non-highway? Yeah, we can also vote and say there's no low speed vehicles also. I mean, we could make it more restrictive within our community. Okay. But, um, and then we, nobody's riding anything. Uh, so True. I mean, we, we could do that, um, but we were just making the option saying that if we didn't make a decision here, the low speed moving vehicles would still be allowed under that description in the ordinance, and the non-highway vehicles that didn't meet that description would not be allowed. Yeah, it seems like that may be an easier place to be, although it's not expressed in what we're asked to do here. And it's all electric or battery-operated vehicles, right? So any danger that, that bicycles would cause, would cause are not in this category because no. bicycles are... And I, I don't know, does that mean that the new electric bikes and the new battery-operated bikes are, which category do they go in? I mean, I think there's a lot of questions to take a look at this. I guess that's what I'm getting at. I'm glad we brought it up. I'm glad you brought it up. We promised the community we would. Um, I just don't think we have even enough of the base information. Um, like, I think there's more than these two options. And so, um, and maybe that means you go with option two so that we gather more information and come up with a solution. I mean, I, I don't know, but I'm just still wondering, considering the situation, why we're even talking about non-highway vehicles. But that's what was researched, as you said. Correct. Um, because some problems could be solved. We'd have to put, I think, safety measures around that. Like the first thing I would vote for is you have to have a seatbelt. <laughs> and because you do with non-highway, but you apparently don't with slow vehicles. So, I mean, there's all kind of ways you could do it, but okay, thanks. Administrator White. Thank you. I just I want to clarify a couple of things here because I think they're we're getting we're getting a few things confused. So the the state vehicle code is what defines and identifies the difference between a low speed vehicle and a non highway vehicle. In that state vehicle code is also a listing of minimum vehicle requirements, including safety requirements that have to be had in each of those types of vehicles in order for them to be street legal. So a low speed vehicle is considered street legal because it has all of the safety requirements and it is, it is manufactured to be driven on state roads with vehicles, with regular cars, that's how it is manufactured to be. A non-highway vehicle, which can also be a golf cart, it could be four wheelers, it could be all the different types of uh, recreational style vehicles that we've talked about. Um, are not manufactured to be street legal. They are manufactured in a different way. They can be modified to add safety features like seat belts, like brake lights, like uh, various other types of street, you know, the blinker lights for turn signals. Um, all of those things can be enhanced in a non-highway vehicle, but they're not manufactured with the purpose of driving on the roads, which is why the state vehicle code has deemed them to be not legal on state roads or on any road unless the local community passes an ordinance and takes, takes an action 
to say that in our community they are legal on the roads. That's why this question keeps coming up of what we're doing with non-highway vehicles. So I don't think we can say just categorize them one way or the other because they've already been defined and categorized by the state vehicle code. So the question tonight that we were asked to bring forward is does the city want staff and a work group to, to dedicate resources and time to evaluate the different procedures that Brooke, our city attorney, has outlined in her memo on page two. The, the state vehicle code specifies that a local community can pass an ordinance to allow non-highway vehicles. But in order to do that, there are certain procedural requirements that include identifying the type of non-highway vehicles, the city streets on which those vehicles are permitted, the volume, speed, and character of traffic on those streets, determining that the identified non-highway vehicles may be safely operated on or across the city streets, and that public safety will not be jeopardized by the use of identified non-highway vehicles on city streets. And then we can adopt an ordinance allowing the types of non-highway vehicles that we've deemed are appropriate, and then, and then post the appropriate language. So that lines out the procedures that are required by the state vehicle code in order for the city to pass its own ordinance allowing non-highway vehicles. So if we create the work group, um, which is option two in chief's summary, the work group would have to identify the mechanism in which we would make a determination as a city that those non-highway vehicles are in fact safe and do not jeopardize public safety, which is why we were recommending hiring a consultant, somebody that is informed enough and that understands how to do that evaluation and establish that criteria of what parts of the community could these types of vehicles safely operate in without creating a public risk. So there is a requirement to make a determination as a city that they are safe for us to pass that ordinance. And that's what, that's really the question here is are we designating a work group to work with Brooke, with the staff, with the consultant potentially, so that we can meet all those procedural requirements with the intent of passing an ordinance that allows certain type of non-highway vehicles. The reason we keep broadening it to non-highway vehicles, the issue was originally brought, brought forward as golf carts, but the night that we had the public meeting and we had people hear from the public, there was specifically a gentleman that talked about having a four-wheeler. You've observed and talked about 4th of July. There's all kinds of other vehicles that we as staff have observed on city streets that are non approved non-highway vehicles, not low-speed vehicles or vehicles that are legal on city roads. Um, so we know that there are those vehicles in the community. We have not previously endorsed it. Right now, they are not legal for city streets, so the police department can enforce that and has been if people are doing unsafe things. But that's really the determination at this point is we can't just, if we're going to go the route of an ordinance, I don't think we can just leave it with, with golf carts because they're not the only type of uh, non-highway vehicle that we have in the war in the community. So just trying to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Mayor Brummel. <clears throat> oh, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. All the medievals. Yeah, I don't know if I should address this to the um, city administrator or to the police chief. Um, so just a simple question, is a golf cart a slow moving vehicle or is it have to be a non-highway vehicle it could, I, I can't decide this till I get my base yeah so so a golf cart can be either one okay. a golf cart there are certain types of golf carts that are now manufactured with a VIN number with all of the safety requirements and so they are categorized as low speed vehicles if they were not intentionally manufactured to be street legal and they don't have a VIN number, which is why they can't be licensed by the state, or they don't meet the requirements of the different safety options that are included in the vehicle code that are required, then they're non-highway vehicles and therefore not street legal because it's how they're manufactured. So they can be, they can be both. That's the confusing part is a golf cart can be a low speed vehicle. It can also be a non-highway vehicle. It depends on how it was manufactured. If it comes with a VIN number, it was manufactured to be street legal. Right. So a lot of these other vehicles won't have VIN numbers. The other kinds that you guys have been talking about. So those would be slow speed. Okay. So, I mean, if we're willing to classify those golf carts as slow moving vehicles and pay attention to the state law, which is already in place, um, we don't have to do anything. And that's not option one necessarily. I mean, we still would have to figure out if we wanted to 
I'm not in favor of this at all, but do an accept. I mean, this VIN number is an issue to the citizens. I understand mm -hmm. that. But I'm still just trying to figure out how we could do this more simply if we classify everything as. So, so there's no way we can change that rule. Okay. No. That's what these. Even second though, question. right. The, the, so the vehicle code as written, while it permits a local authority, a local government authority to pass its own ordinance, it does not allow us to reduce the requirements of what the vehicle has to have in terms of minimum standard safety features in order for it to be on the road. Okay, so oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, so every vehicle that's going to be classified as the slow-moving vehicle, be a golf cart or an battery or electric bicycle or all the other things that have been mentioned tonight, um, they can stay in the slow-moving vehicle. With, they don't need a VIN number. Just the golf court needs a VIN number. No. So um, I think we're transposing the two terms. So a low-speed vehicle right now is legal by states. Right, right. I know that. Those are allowed to be on the, on the road, and we don't have to take any action. So if they have a VIN number, if they are classified as a low-speed vehicle, they are currently legal to be on city roads. There's nothing we have to do um, to change that. They are already allowed. If it's a non-highway vehicle and it doesn't meet the criteria to be a low-speed vehicle because it doesn't have a VIN number, wasn't manufactured for the roads, doesn't meet the certain safety protocols or safety requirement features that are listed in the vehicle code, then they are illegal on roads within the state of Illinois unless we pass a local ordinance that allows them. So that's where the action comes into play. If we are saying that we believe they are safe, we can allow them on city streets with certain restrictions, there's speed limitations, they can't cross state roads, they can't be on county roads, there's all kinds of limitations to, it, even if we allow them in Warrenville, um, where they're allowed to be within Warrenville. But they still have to meet basic safety requirements, they still have to have the, the safety features that are required within the vehicle code. We cannot change that, and we can't change the categorization of whether it's a low-speed vehicle or a non-highway vehicle. Although golf carts are both. Correct. Anything else is both, and to your knowledge or um, research? I don't know. I mean, I guess there, it's possible there could be some other recreational vehicles that are manufactured with a VIN number with all the safety okay. requirements. Okay, but, it, but it's legal, but it, it, it depends on how they're manufactured. It's the VIN number that is the problem then, even for you guys. Yes, because in order for the state to license them, they have to have a VIN number. That's how they're categorized as low-speed vehicles. That's why the non-highway vehicles are having a, a hard time. The owners of the non-highway vehicles are having a hard time getting a state registration right. because they don't have a VIN number, and therefore it doesn't meet the requirements to be a low-speed vehicle. For either of the two vehicles, can we change the speed limit in any way, or do we go under what the state has already decided? Uh, that is something that we would likely have to evaluate. There are restrictions within the vehicle code about the speed limit. I believe it's 30, it has to be less than 30 or 35 miles per hour, even if we pass a local ordinance. And again, they wouldn't be permitted on county roads or, or state roads. There are some restrictions as to how they would cross even county or state roads, even if we allow them here. So we would very likely have to create very specific perimeters of where these non-highway vehicles would be allowed to ride around in the community. Which we wouldn't have to do with slow-moving vehicles, right? Correct. Thank you. We don't have to do anything with low-speed vehicles. Okay, thanks. I think the other thing that could, in Brooke's uh, memo, how she explained the low-speed vehicles, she said uh, any four-wheeled vehicle. So anything that's four-wheeled could be considered that low speed as long as it wasn't maximum greater speed than 20 miles per hour but not greater than 25, and then it would be allowed on the streets uh, as long as a speed limit of 30 miles per hour or less. But So the low speed can only be four-wheeled vehicles. So that would make, I mean, however you want to classify those off-road would then be the electric and all the other stuff to talk about. Yeah, and I think electric bicycles, I, I know there's been some discussion in other communities about this too because they're becoming more popular. I think that is separate from this discussion. I don't think those are considered low-speed vehicles. No. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, no. Rumble. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Rumble. 
Wow. <laughs> that might be a blessing. <laughs> Um, I have a number of concerns about this. I, my my um, preferred path forward would be option one, the city takes no further action. We, the police department would enforce the Illinois Vehicle Code as it pertains to non-highway vehicles. The low-speed vehicles are already legal. Uh, the reason, uh, two reasons that I'm particularly opposed to this. First of all, not a lot of folks don't want these things on the road. They see them as a danger, see them as the danger that they are. Um, young kids uh, out at night without uh, the proper safety precautions, without lights, um, uh, we don't want those types of things on the road. We want to make sure that the roads are safe. And that's the other thing. We pass an ordinance that is less restrictive than the state um, ordinance or the state's uh, statute, then we take uh, the responsibility for saying, yeah, it's safe to do that in Warrenville. And the first time someone gets injured or gets killed on one of those vehicles, guess who they're going to sue? Do we really want to give the, uh, um, the community the exposure for potential for something to go wrong when it's not necessary? Um, we already have a law from the state that's perfectly workable. Um, the other thing is, if two aldermen uh, want to you know, research this thing to the max and come back with a recommendation, I'm fine with that. I am absolutely opposed to any staff time being put into this. We have a staff that is already overworked on very substantive issues that involve the future of the community and the community running smoothly currently. Do we really want to invest a lot more time? As Look at the time sink tonight, the, the discussion for this particular thing that there's already a solution for. Um, staff needs to have their time on things that um, are already in the hopper and things that uh, involve the future of the community and the, and the present uh, operation of the community. So again, if two uh, aldermen want to research this thing to the max and come back with a recommendation to uh, a committee, great, go for it. Uh, as far as having uh, all these other things that the, the uh, staff is going to be involved in doing all this research, I think it's a big mistake and a waste of time. And I think that um, for the most part, I want only vehicles that are safe and recognized safe by the state to be on the roads. I do not wish the others to be out there. Um, the potential for exposure, again, to the uh, community is huge as far as I'm concerned. So um, my option would be option one. Let's take no further action. Let's just go with what the state already has done and figured out. Um, and keep in mind, too, and this has all been mentioned at other meetings, Nobody around us, around us in the communities allow these things on the road. So people that are passing through our community are going to potentially um, be forced to uh, confront something that they're not used to, that they don't see anywhere else because no one else is doing it. Um, that is a potential for disaster as far as I'm concerned. We have a lot of cut through community uh, action out there. A lot of people go through Warrenville to get somewhere else. This is not the Warrenville of 60 years ago when it was quiet little neighborhoods and perhaps this was an acceptable practice. That time has passed. Um, I really think it's a bad idea to open the door to any other vehicles that are currently not allowed. Alderman Barry. Thank you. <clears throat> After I've looked this over, I... Um, agree that um, option number one is the the way I would go, mostly because of the fact that I think that we're kind of um, maybe trying to help the people that don't have these VIN numbers, and it's a handful of people, and it appears that their kids are out there riding in these vehicles at night. I've seen them, I've run into them, not physically run into them, but I've seen them on the roads as I'm driving through Warrenville. And it, for me, it's a huge safety issue. Um, I also don't like the fact that if we go with option two, we are going to be spending it, a minimum of at least $20,000 in consulting fee expenses. And I don't think that we need to waste that kind of money um, because somebody wants a golf cart and it doesn't have a VIN number. That's it. If you want your kids to be riding around in a vehicle that's not legal um, and they're not old enough to have a driver's license, then you better be prepared to 
pay the price because if the police catch them, they'll be ticketed. And the parent will be ticketed, not the kids, because they own the vehicle. So um, I think after I've thought about this this whole time, I think at the beginning I was more concerned about, yeah, these people have already invested this money in these vehicles, but that's not it. It's the safety of the entire community. Thank you. Alderman Whitener. I want to, <coughs> Chief, do we have any idea on what the population is of these two different types of vehicles in our community? Um, I, I don't. Do you think it's... We don't have any kind of more research than, into More that. than 100 or 200, or we have just no idea? Uh, of people that want them? Of that, people that currently have them that we're trying to I wouldn't create. say there's that many, no. Not even that many? No. So we're, we're attempting to... According to Brooke Linneman's or the attorney Linneman's memo, it, it looks like we're, she's outlined a way to supersede Illinois state codes with her memo. And key among the statement that um, City Administrator White said is that public safety cannot be jeopardized with anything that we can come up with. And I guess creating a safer community is something that I really want to do as an alderman and a city representative. I would not want to put myself or anybody in a position where the city is made to be less safe. And, um, you know, so together with the $20,000 cost of opportunity and the fact that I think we would be creating a law that potentially could jeopardize our public safety with the increases of these type of vehicles and the the cost doesn't end at, at 20,000 when you think of the registration you're going to have to um, make sure these things are retrofitted so that they meet state codes you would have city mapping licensing ordinance development signage educational programs speed limit changes on top of the twenty thousand dollars that that you would be asking staff and cons additional consultants to do for a hundred or two hundred people that might own own these things, and I just don't don't see it. And um, I I I'm taking my alderman responsibilities um, seriously. I want to make the community safer. Uh, the National Institute of Health in, in 2023 indicated that there were 15,000 injuries per year from people um, utilizing these kinds of vehicles. And 82% of the injuries were ejection. So it wasn't little scrapes and bruises. These were, when you look into it and do a deep dive, into the rate of incidents and the number of incidents, there are serious injuries that are occurring as communities develop ordinances and increase the opportunities for people to use these. In the same token, vehicles are getting quieter, they're getting faster, they're getting larger, and as the mayor pointed out, they're using our community as um, a cut through area. So I don't see any need to develop a work group to supersede what exists as a uh, Illinois Department of Transportation advised uh, regulation and jeopardize the public safety in our community. So I, I, I don't think we need a work group either. Thank you. Alderman Davalos. Yeah, I just need to get something clear here. Um, all these vehicles can be on the road currently with the slow moving vehicle. We already have that whole law. The only thing that's different is the VIN number on golf carts. So you can have as many golf carts as you want rolling anywhere as long as they're in the speed limit and the right roads if they have a VIN number. And all the other vehicles we've mentioned, there's nothing. I mean, they're not going away because under state law, most of this stuff is already legal. So whatever we do here is not going to change really all the problems we're talking about because they're still on there. You, you have the right 
golf cart plus any other four-wheel vehicle, which that was a good point you made, Alderman Lockett. Heck, there's still all the reasons we were talking about here for not wanting these vehicles, they're still going to be here. Maybe the ones, the golf carts without the VIN won't. Um, also, you have to have a driver's license, so no little kid is going to be driving. I mean, I would hope Chief Bonilla and the rest of the police force would pull if they saw kids under 16, over, because nobody gets to do that. And they have to be insured, and they have to have certain lights, and they have to have all this kind of stuff that's in the slow-moving vehicle ordinance. It's already there. So I just kind of want to, as I'm trying to figure this out, I want to make sure what we're saying. We are not going to keep the majority of these vehicles off the road unless somebody makes some kind of state law about different ways to handle slow-moving vehicles differently. And so that's what I'm trying to figure out here is, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to vote option one or option two. It seems like even if we vote option one, we could still be flooded with these vehicles. So that's my dilemma. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Administrator <laughs> White. Um, <laughs> reason, Alderman. So the low-speed vehicles are legal because they are able to get registered through the state. So the state has determined that they meet all of the safety requirements. They have the VIN number. They are issuing them a registration similar to uh, having a regular passenger vehicle where you go and you get it registered right through the state. With that comes the ability to then get that vehicle insured, which is also a requirement. With the, I think with the non-highway vehicle, I'm guessing you're also going to find that there's a struggle with getting them insured because they're not registered through the state because they're not street legal. So while there are going to be vehicles that look like golf carts or vehicles that are recreational vehicles on city streets, if they meet the low speed vehicle requirement, yes, they will still be on the street so that you're not going to completely eliminate that unless we take a more restrictive action, which no one is recommending. Um, I think the challenge that we're facing is that there are several vehicles in the community that are not street legal, that are being driven on the streets, and back to, I think, Alderman Lockett's point, we're in a little bit of this gray area because they know it's being discussed, and I think they're getting maybe some mixed messaging about what's permitted and what's not permitted. So um, we have observed vehicles that shouldn't be on the street. We've observed scooters, we've observed motorized, all kinds of things that are being driven on city streets. The question becomes if they get pulled over because there's an accident or something happens, if they cannot produce a registration and insurance like any other vehicle get, that gets pulled over, they would be ticketed because they're essentially then driving a illegal vehicle on the road. So I, I, I'm not sure if that clarifies what you're asking, but I'm you're talking about more vehicles in this category than just the golf course. Correct. That there's all kinds of non-highway vehicles, I think, in the community currently that are non that are not street legal, that are currently being driven around the community. And but you but you said before that the only one that needed the VIN number, uh, or that would be penalized without a VIN number, would be the golf cart. So the other vehicles. No, 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 no. Any non-highway vehicle that is. Unless we pass an ordinance to the alternative allowing non-highway vehicles, unless we take an action to allow non-highway vehicles, as it stands today, if we take no action, those non-highway vehicles are not legal on the roads. So if they get pulled over, if they get stopped, the, the police department does have the discretion to ticket them because they are not legal for use on the roads. That could be a golf cart that's non-highway vehicle. That could be a four-wheeler. could be any vehicle that is a non-highway vehicle. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just, yeah. I thought it was just the golf courts. Okay. Mayor Brummel. Just by, by way of clarification, if we go with the things as they are currently constructed through the state statute, the only vehicles that will be allowed to be on the road in Warrenville will be ones that meet the safety requirements of the state and are licensed through the state. Yes, those vehicles still get to go on the road. Everything else that's not will get ticketed and will not be allowed on the road. So it's not like we're going to have the same number of things on the road and we're saying that's okay. No, we're saying it's not okay. We're saying that we're considered, we're very concerned about the safety aspect. 
if you meet the requirements of the state and that vehicle is deemed state uh, safe by the state and you can get it insured, you get to drive it on the road. Anything else, no, you can't drive it on the road. It's not meant to be on the road because it doesn't have seatbelts, lights, whatever. It doesn't have insurance. And the likelihood of somebody getting hurt is far more likely because they're not regulated vehicles. Those vehicles will be eliminated. All we have to do is continue what we're doing and give the chief the, the uh, direction to say, make sure they're safe. If they're not safe, if they're not licensed by the state, they get off the road. They get ticketed. So if we just do nothing at this point, it's not doing nothing. It's recognizing the state's already gone through all this and set up a number of things that have to be done to recognize those vehicles as being safe. If you don't meet those requirements, you can't drive it on the road. Does that help? Yes, it does help. Last question. If you had a golf cart, had a VIN number, license it with the state, you're fine to drive it. Thank you. Just a comment from the chairman. The, uh, is there an objection to two councilmen working on this independently of staff? I mean, I don't have any objection. That's your time. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Dowles. I don't necessarily have an objection to that, but I'm not ready to say we need the $20,000 yet. I mean, maybe that's down the pike, but I'm not ready to authorize that. But I, I mean, I'm kind of on the fence here a little bit, but I'm not on the fence about the 20,000. Now. Alderman Lockett. Yeah, so going back to that 20,000, we would only need that though, again, if we are going to approve a non-highway vehicles, correct? Well, that is just an estimate if we were to consider approving non-highway vehicles. Sure, but that money would just be kind of earmarked in the budget, but it would not be spent unless it comes to council again first, correct? No. Well, right. it, it would be. Right, so the, the $20,000 that right now is estimated for some sort of a consultant or traffic engineer is for us to be able to meet the requirement listed in Attorney Lenneman's uh, memo for making on page three, one of the procedural requirements is that the city has to determine that non-highway vehicles may safely travel on or across city streets and not jeopardize, not jeopardize the uh, public safety. So, so the we would be hiring the consultant to assess what areas of town would fit within that parameter of allowing these non-highway vehicles to safely drive around the community without jeopardizing public safety. But what would trigger that 20000 in the work group? Like, would the work group have to come to a consensus of that's the path we're moving forward, then we would have to trigger the 20000 get the get it done, right? Because we're not going to spend the 20000 to have the discussion, correct? I so the, no, the work group would have to start with identifying the types of non-highway vehicles that we conceptually would want to have allowed, the city streets on which we think the non-highway vehicles will be allowed, uh, and then where, where we get into the consultant is looking at the volume, speed, and character of traffic currently on city streets and determining where it would be safe for them to, to travel. Because I think really all we want is the LSV without a VIN is kind of, you know, ultimately. But, yeah, I just didn't know if there's any way to do the motion without the 20000 right, Um I would just reiterate, if two elected officials want to spend their own personal time researching this and bringing it back, it's your own personal time. What I'm opposed to is putting together an official work group for the council to do this and spend staff time doing it to do the research. I think that's not the right thing to do. Um, I don't see any possible way that it makes any sense for the city to contravene the state statute. The state's already figured out how to get vehicles on the road that are safe. Why would we want to get in the business of determining what's safe and what's not safe and then say, well, we're, we know better than the state, so we're going to leave, leave these vehicles on the road too, even though the state doesn't. That opens us to a huge possible can of worms in terms of exposure. That makes no sense. All four 
And it's not in the hundreds, I'm sure. It's in the dozens, maybe even less, of people that would want to drive these on the road. I got nothing against that. They're fun. I mean, that was made in the first meeting. Sure, they're fun. How much exposure do we want to give the community so a few people can have fun? I, that's an easy answer for me. None. Have fun on your property. Uh, let the kids drive those things around on the property and do whatever. That's great. It's a lot of fun. I did it when I was a kid. But they shouldn't be on the street. This is a debate that makes no sense to me. We have a state statute that has determined what's safe to be on the street. All we have to do is abide by that statute and move on. If you don't meet those requirements, it doesn't belong on the street, period. What's the study? I don't get it. Anyone else? Alderman Berry. Alderman, Alderman Berry. I agree with the mayor. I just think that the whole thing is totally unsafe, and um, by allowing the golf carts that don't have VIN numbers, that don't have all the items that are necessary to make it safe for the people that are driving them and riding in them, and for the other vehicles that are out on the street, um, I just don't know how you're going to be able to police one of these vehicles when they're in the neighborhood and all of a sudden they want to cross Butterfield Road. That Butterfield Road is not, does not belong to Warrenville. What happens when they want to cross Route 59? How do you get them to not do that? That's a huge issue. Sometimes you can't, we've had people get killed on Route 59 crossing the street. Uh, so I, I just think this is, Definitely not a good thing. I don't want to see the staff waste their time. If several aldermen want to get together and discuss this, uh, that's up to them. And um, But I will, at this point, never agree to go forward. Alderman Davalos? Yeah, I, I think what's being said may, makes some sense here, but here's what doesn't make sense to me, is... <laughs> Take two golf courts, one with a VIN and one without the VIN. And any one of those golf courts could cross 59 or do whatever. Now, they be, should be picked up because you're not supposed to, for either one of them, you're not supposed to do that. But it is, it, to me, the, it's so illogical. Why doesn't the state care about the safety issues with this law moving? They seem not to, they're not asking us about that in our community, but they are asking us to go through this whole process um, for the non-highway vehicles. So you have the same vehicle. It doesn't, one has a VIN, one doesn't, but they both are going to have safety features on them. They both have to have certain things on them. I'm not saying that I'm in favor of the vehicles without the VIN. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it is so crazy that we have to spend money to prove that those vehicles are safe well, they, we don't have to prove anything about this slow movie. It could be the same vehicle, except that one has a number and one has, but doesn't. I, the license makes the difference. It's the same thing with an automobile. You can have a car without a license, and you can drive it, but it's not legal. It doesn't mean it's unsafe necessarily, but the state certifies with that license that this vehicle meets the requirements for safety that have been recognized as necessary to make that vehicle safe. That's the difference. Well, probably the police has to do that because when you get a car, they're not, you just give them your information for your registration and title. And what I'm saying is, it's so hard for me. I haven't really had it be this hard before. It's so illogical what's going on. No, I don't necessarily want to do that either. What I'm just telling you is some of the things that you and some of the other aldermen have said make a lot of sense for the non-highway, but don't make a lot of sense for the slow moving. So. I won't talk about this anymore because I'm just wasting everybody's time. But I'm just saying this, it, it, I feel sad that we only have a choice of non-highway. We don't have a choice of doing anything with the, the slow moving, even though it's the same vehicle without a certain number. But anyway, I'm not, I won't. Administrator, wait. Just um, something to point out. Page two uh, of Brooks' memo, uh, the... Fifth bullet point uh, lists the min minimum vehicle requirements for the non-highway vehicles. On page four, there is an additional bullet point that talks about additional minimum vehicle requirements for low-speed vehicles that the state has determined are street legal. So they have to have 
all of the same minimum safety requirements as those non-highway vehicles plus parking brake, windshield conforming to federal, federal vehicle safety standards, a vehicle identification number, which is the VIN, seat belts, and exterior rear, rear view mirror mount mounted on driver's side. So I think I, I understand where you're coming from with the a golf cart can be one, it can be the other, right? But I think the key from the state vehicle code perspective is that the non-highway vehicles were not manufactured to be on the street, whereas the low-speed vehicles were. So I think that's maybe not the most logical thing, but I think it comes down to what's manufactured to be street legal versus which, what's manufactured for other uses and modified to become street legal. Like getting the golf cart from a, a golf course is getting rid of their golf carts are not made as well or as safely as one that is made with a bin. That's and that's, example. okay, yeah. that, that's the first thing that's made sense since we started. Thank you. Anyone else? Motion? You don't need a motion. No, okay. Uh, then we will move on. Number five, <coughs> <Administ or coughs> Finance Director Dahlstrom. Yeah, I don't want to be administrator, thank you. Um, <laughs> How about an alderman? <laughs> uh, no, I'll give that to you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman, included with the uh, backup tonight is a memo outlining uh, the request for a 10% uh, water rate increase and a 5% sewer rate increase effective May 1st of 2024. That increase has been included in the proposed budget um, so far. Uh, the two things to point out related to that is there is no recommended increase in the Naperville tr treatment plant uh, fee, which was established a year ago. And there is also um, no recommended increase for the sewer-only accounts. There are approximately 185 of those. We are reassessing if we are pr 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 properly char charging those 185 accounts to, to, to determine if the, uh, if the fee we charge, charge, charge them now is too high, too, too, too low, or very accurate. Uh, so with, with those um, um, two carry-outs, uh, the staff and the EMRP work have recommended a 10% uh, water increase and a 5% sewer rate increase. Also, as part of the EMRP, uh, I'm sorry, ERP uh, that we are working on, um, it's been recommended as a best management prayer, prayer, prayer practice that so we change from bi-monthly billing to monthly billing. We also feel that the advantage to that will be that it will be a little easier on our residents to be able to pay bills regularly um, every m month as opposed to having to have a bigger ch chunk of a bill every other month. Uh, we do get a lot of inquiries from residents about why we don't bill monthly now, so, 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 such as NICOR and ComEdu, um, and they ask that fairly regularly. So as part of, as, um, be, because the uh, ERP uh, cons consultant has recommended that it's a best ma management prayer practice, we feel that this is a good time also to offer that to our r r residents to be able to even out their bill payments over the year. Um, it won't have any change, change on the dollar of the value that, that they pay over the course of a year, but it'll m m make it a little easier on some, some of them to pay more regularly than every other month. Questions from the council? Treasurer Goodman. Yes, I'd like to make a suggestion here. Uh, we need to do number one, which is to increase the rates, has been suggested. And I certainly understand the motivation for number two. And then number three is to write the requisite ordinances. But I'd like to suggest a number four, uh, that we direct staff to consider tuning the late fees. If we go from uh, monthly to bi-monthly, that means that someone who misses uh, the late fee will get charged the 10%, which is what I believe the late fee is, in one month rather than uh, 
after two months. Um, something, you know, an alternative might be, for example, to charge a dollar or two if they miss the first month and then kick in the 10% at the second month. Uh, the late fees always struck me as relatively high when thought of as a percentage. They're not compounded, but 10% over the course of two months is an APR of 77%. 10% over one month is an APR of 213%. Um, so I think it, it won't cost us any more to have that late fee the second month if someone doesn't pay, but it might be something we can do to just uh, help some residents who might forget to make a payment right away. Administrator White. Thank you. Um, I think that's a good point to make. I would prefer if the um, if there was going to be another action taken that it be direct staff to evaluate a different structure to the late fees, um, just so that we can take some time to look into what the best model is. Because I do think there are some potential concerns with not not charging a late fee or not having some sort of penalty associated with late payment that then promotes essentially people not paying their bill on time. So I, I think there's some things we want to maybe evaluate before we make that determination. I think that's what I said. Oh, okay. I, I, I thought I heard no. skipping for one month and doing it in the second month. So I just No, no. I said number four, direct staff to consider tuning the late fee. Oh, okay. And then I went on to just give an example of something. Perfect. Thank you. I think that makes sense. Thank you very much. Alderman Lockett. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council approve one, a 10% water rate and 5% sewer rate increase effective May 1st, 2024. Two, a change in the frequency for the issuance of water and sewer billing from the current bi monthly to a monthly frequency as soon as operationally practical. Three, direct staff to work with the city attorney to prepare the code amendments needed to authorize these recommendations for consideration as a part of the April 2024 city council meeting agenda. And four, direct staff to review current late fee structure. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Item six, an informational update <clears throat> from the Administration Finance Police Department FYI 2024 work plans. Uh, just information only, so if anybody has any questions. First of all, if any, any of staff would like to make any comments. If not, um, any questions from the council? I think, I think we're done. Why do we just need one more motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Chief, would you like to read the <coughs> commendations? I received a letter from a surety and insurance company. Um, Dear Chief Bonilla, I'm writing to express my sincere appreciation and commendation for the exemplary performance and professionalism displayed by Officer Nate Maciak, Melissa Barma, Sal Perez, and Corporal Gizmondi. Their outstanding efforts and unwavering dedication were instrumental in the successful capture of a fugitive who was wanted on multiple warrants in Illinois and a fugitive warrant from Florida. The assistance provided by Officers Maciak, Barma, Perez, and Corporal Gizmondi during the investigation and apprehension was exemplary. Their swift response to repeated calls for service and their continued diligence ultimately led to the successful arrest of the fugitive on March 3rd, 2024. Their coordinated efforts and commitment to duty reflect positively on the Warrenville Police Department and demonstrate the higher standards of law enforcement professionalism. Please convey my heartfelt gratitude and commendation to Officers Maciek, 
Barma, Perez, and Corporal Gizmati for their exceptional service and contributions to public safety. Their professionalism, dedication, and commitment to duty are truly commendable and deserving of recognition. Thank you, excellent. Thank you. Alder Lockett. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We're, we are adjourned.